Ribbit. When the FBI arrived, a series of things went through my mind at once about how I had got to this point. My family and what would happen to them. My training and how I got to be at this point. My network in Russia and beyond, especially the key sources I had used. My relationship with Christopher Steele. I double, triple checked myself and what I had written in that dossier. In the hours, days, weeks that followed, in interview after interview with the FBI, I kept checking and rechecking myself. Did I get this wrong? In many ways, I am just a camera, a recording device, a sponge. My job is to soak up, seek out and organize information when asked a question by a client. That is what I did in this case. I was asked a question, and I answered it to the best of my ability. That was an exclusive. A direct quote from primary subsource of Christopher Steele's dossier. The document that took the world by storm. Its origins can be traced back to 2015, and more specifically, Fusion GPS, a commercial research and strategic intelligence firm based in Washington, D.C. The company was co-founded in 2011 by Glenn Simpson, Peter Frisch, and Thomas Catan, all three former Wall Street Journal journalists. Based in the nation's capital, some of their work has been political. A 2012 Wall Street Journal op-ed revealed that Fusion GPS worked for the Democrats. Their job was to complete opposition research on Mitt Romney. Fusion GPS would later be engaged in the early 2016 cycle. The role this time was to provide research on multiple candidates in the Republican presidential primary. In spring 2016, when Trump had emerged as the likely Republican candidate, the Washington Free Beacon stopped funding investigations into Trump. However, the investigations did not stop. From April 2016 through October 2016, Seattle-based law firm Perkins Coie retained Fusion GPS in order to continue opposition research on Trump. This was on behalf of the 2016 Hillary Clinton presidential campaign and the Democratic National Committee. People deny that the campaign or the DNC knew the details of Fusion GPS's work. In June 2016, Fusion GPS commissioned former British intelligence officer Christopher Steele. He was a retired MI6 officer with considerable expertise on Russian matters. They wanted him to use his contacts in Moscow to find out what he could about Trump's connections to the Russian movement. This investigation and later documents would go to be known as the Steele Dossier. This is the version of the report that would go on to become infamous worldwide. Although it was titled The Steele Dossier, much of the raw intelligence came from another source. A sub-source. And, for the first time ever, we will tell their story. I am officially running for President of the United States, and we are going to make our country great again. Donald Trump on the stump looking certain to be the Republican nominee, but he had enemies, opponents curious about Russia. By June, a former British spy had been enlisted to dig into Trump's Russian dealings. Christopher Steele, he is the author of a dossier, a 35 page dossier, which um, he thought contained or said uh, contained such scurrilous details about President elect Trump. Um, that he handed it to the FBI. Keep digging was the response. He did. His dossier growing with reports of information exchanged between Russian intermediaries and the Trump team. Several of his sources speaking to salacious evidence being held by Moscow. At a security conference in Nova Scotia in late November, Senator John McCain was approached by a Western diplomat who'd seen the dossier, thought the reports of Trump's Russian entanglements deserved attention. The bombshell burst Tuesday evening when CNN reported the president-elect and President Obama were briefed on the matter last week. The report included unsubstantiated claims that Russian intelligence compiled a dossier on Mr. Trump. Because if it's false, if it's fake, why would it land up 
on Barack Obama's desk. Right, so for the moment, uh, the real story is uh, it, uh, the allegations themselves are unverified. Um, they're obviously quite salacious in nature. Um, the real story is that the intelligence community thought it was appropriate to brief the President of the United States and the President-elect. Um, that means that serious people are taking this seriously. The former Canadian intelligence officer who spent a decade on the Soviet desk doing counterintelligence says the allegations in the documents surely look like classic tactics. He sees some errors, some oddities, but says this has the feel of the real thing. If it is a fake story, it was made by somebody who knows the game. If it is a true story, it is very, very close to what we've seen before. It, it does feel right. It does feel like the kind of thing that Russians do. A lot of those details fit. Also, I think the author has some credibility. And what if what's in these pages is true? Does that make this just trouble or treason? It really is hard to make a distinction if we don't know who those sources are. So he, he talks about his sources providing various information. It's all fake news. It's phony stuff. It didn't happen. Where exactly did Steele get the information that's in his report? We now know. Uh, my colleagues have spoken to have said Christopher Steele is a, a serious player. You know, he was a respected intelligence officer. June 16th, 2016. Fusion GPS hired Christopher Steele to investigate links between Russia and Donald Trump. Steele came onto the project about nine months in. The investigation on Trump and his relationship with Russia was part of a much broader project, which involved looking at his entire business career. Christopher Steele was described as credible, someone who had a sound record of reporting on criminal cases. Mr. Steele contacted the person who would become the main subsource in March 2016 and assigned him to ask people he knew in Russia and Ukraine about connections, including any ties to corruption between a pro-Russian government in Ukraine and the veteran Republican strategist Paul Manafort. Mr. Steele did not explain why, but Mr. Manafort joined the Trump campaign around that time and was later promoted to his chairman. He was later convicted in 2018 of tax and bank fraud and other charges that grew out of the Russia investigation Mr. Steele later expanded the subsource's assignment to look for any compromising information about Mr. Trump. And we all know how that went. Dossier. The dossier. That controversial document. It alleges overt, knowing collusion. Wild, unconfirmed accusations. It was a bombshell. Amongst the many revelations, the Steele dossier alleged that the Kremlin had been cultivating Trump for at least five years. It is said that the FSB spy agency had secretly videoed Trump during his trip to Moscow for the Miss Universe beauty pageant, filming him inside the hotel's presidential suite with two sex workers. Trump strenuously denies the claim. Last week, BuzzFeed received a considerable amount of criticism after it published a leaked dossier claiming that Russia, and specifically Vladimir Putin, had some pretty incriminating information on Donald Trump. Now, that information included an accusation that Trump uh, hired prostitutes to urinate on a bed in a hotel room that the Obama stayed in. Trump didn't allegedly order them to piss on him. He ordered them to piss on a bed, allegedly, which again is unverified, I, I don't believe it, whatever. I was assigned simply to gather raw intelligence for my employer, Christopher Steele, and passed along claims that raised a potential red flag. I was not responsible for how Mr. Steele portrayed that information in the dossier, nor for making it public. I met with several people, who I won't identify for security reasons, in Moscow and St. Petersburg. I would casually steer the conversation towards whether they had heard anything compromising about Mr. Trump. One of them first mentioned the rumor about the tape. The contact told me Mr. Trump was well known in Russia. The second contact also independently brought up a compromising video of Mr. Trump of a sexual nature that may have been covertly filmed at the Ritz-Carlton. That person did not mention urination. I went to the Ritz-Carlton and chatted up a manager about rumors regarding celebrity visitors. 
The manager made a vague comment that security officials had covertly wired the hotel to gather compromising materials about important guests. I circled around it, you know, enough for them to say, look, yeah, there is a, you know, a funny thing. There be a tape of Mr. Trump, might be sexual, but you know, things that happen at Ritz-Carlton stay at Ritz-Carlton. Even raw intelligence from credible sources, I take it with a grain of salt, who knows, what if it's not particularly accurate? Is it just a rumor or is there more to it? The salacious material in the dossier formed a small part of a 35-page document. The allegation would be amusing were it not for the fact that any covert FSB recording might be used for blackmail purposes. Despite its outlandish assertions and partisan provenance, Steele's work product somehow became a roadmap for Democratic leaders, media outlets, and, most egregiously, intelligence officials carrying out the Russia investigation. In January 2017, shortly after BuzzFeed had published the Steele dossier, and the tape rumor became lodged in American political discourse and pop culture, the primary subsource was contacted by the FBI for an interview. The FBI had approached the subsource as it vetted the dossier's claims. The subsource agreed to tell investigators what they knew. This ranged from questions about his work relationship with Steele to his opinions on the accuracy of the dossier. The subsource asked for an important condition in return. They asked that the FBI keep their identity secret so that they could protect themselves, their livelihood, their sources, and their family and friends in Russia. The FBI agreed, which meant the subsource cooperated fully with the intelligence committee. As the world argued over the legitimacy of the dossier, the subsource remained outside of the media spotlight. For three and a half years, the subsource continued to work in their field. There were numerous investigations and interviews into Trump-Russia ties. However, those who knew the subsource's identity felt it was important to keep it secret. After all, outing the subsource could put their life at risk. But of course, the Republican Party didn't give a damn. In July 2020, Attorney General William P. Barr directed the FBI to declassify a redacted report about his three-day interview with the subsource. This report was handed over to Senator Lindsey Graham, who quickly made the interview summary public while calling the entire Russia investigation corrupt. Joining me right now is Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Lindsey Graham. Let's talk about what we have here. Yeah. Fresh breaking news. These are redacted yeah. documents here. This is a Senate Intel Committee brief. Tell us what these redacted documents tell us. People were getting suspicious about the subsource, the Russian guy, at the Senate Intel Committee level, and the FBI was sent over to brief them, brief them and this is the uh, report they prepared before the briefing, and they did to the Senate Intel Committee, the FBI did, what they did to the FISA court. They misled the hell out of them. They said that there's no evidence from the subsource to suggest that Steele fabricated uh, anything in the dossier. Actually, the subsource said it was all bar talk, hearsay, speculation, and conjecture, and the whole sexual activity of the president was made in jest. So they completely misrepresented to the Senate Intel Committee in 2018 what the subsource had told the FBI in 2017. That is a new crime, a different crime, and I'm going to write a letter to Chris, Christopher Ray and ask him who gave the briefing to the Senate Intel Committee in 2018 and how could they be telling the Senate Intel Committee in 2018 a bunch of lies when they knew better. The report blacked out the subsource's name, but their desire for safety and anonymity was quickly fading. Uh, and he lives right here. Somebody needs to go to jail for this. Just two days later, a pro-Trump blogger released a post entitled, I found the primary subsource. I think they thought I would be an easy target to discredit the dossier. By doubling down on this, they would be able to discredit the whole Russian investigation. At the same time, I also understand that something that the FBI had to look into, and apparently they did. 
As I listen in, I suddenly realize that not only has the steel dossier been hijacked as a symbol of some mythical conspiracy against President Trump, and is continuously used to deflect attention from the pressing issues of the day, but Russian interference and the Trump campaign Russia collusion narrative are still fundamentally misunderstood by the media and the American citizens. My raw intelligence should not have been made public in the first place, and when it was, regrettably, it only impeded counterintelligence efforts to get to the bottom of the Trump-Russia case. The declassified document posted to the Senate Judiciary's Committee's website was sloppy. It left visible clues that meant internet sleuths could identify Igor. It didn't take long for the blog to gain traction. And once that happened, everything Igor feared came to fruition. Where exactly did Steele get the information that's in his report? We now know. The New York Times, among others, are reporting that the person who gave Steele the information is a fellow named Igor Danchenko. RT, the Kremlin-owned English-language news outlet, published an article amplifying Mr. Danchenko's identification. A Ukrainian-born, Russian-educated researcher who worked in the United States and traveled to Moscow to find the supposed dirt. Danchenko describes himself as a Russia-Eurasia political e economic analyst. The decision made by the Justice Department and FBI leaders was completely reckless. But then again, it was hardly surprising. After all, Mr. Barr has repeatedly been accused of abusing his powers to help Mr. Trump politically. Igor Denshenko has been unmasked. He might get killed if something happens. It ends up he's just a swamp creature living just around the corner, just not far from here, Lou. I'm, I'm coming to you from the Capitol this evening. Uh, and he lives right here. Uh, he's not in any danger. Trump and his allies have politicized the U.S. intelligence community selectively declassifying and weaponizing highly sensitive raw materials in order to score political points ahead of the 2020 election. James W. McJunkin, a former FBI assistant director for counterterrorism, told the New York Times, These things have to remain very closely held because you put witnesses at risk. To release sensitive information unnecessarily that could jeopardize someone's life is egregious. The release of Igor Dachenko's interview summary put him in Russia's sights. Agents of the Russian state have murdered such informants previously. In 2006, Alexander Litvinenko, a former FSB officer who was investigating links between Putin and organized crime, died in London after ingesting polonium that was slipped into his drink. Today, almost a decade on from his death, a British judge, Sir Robert Owen, agreed. The Russian Secret Service, the FSB, and Russia's president are probably behind the murder. I have further concluded that the FSB operation to kill Mr. Litvinenko was probably approved by Mr. Patruchev, then head of the FSB, and also by President Putin. For Dushenko, it wasn't just Russia he had to worry about. The former leader of the free world, who at the time was still in office, decided to publicly lambast the man who had agreed to cooperate with the intelligence committee with the understanding of confidentiality. Before his removal, Trump tweeted about Igor multiple times, labeling him a Russian spy. This would be a label many of Trump's allies would also use. The former president's conduct has not only caused substantial harm to Mr. Jachenko's professional and personal reputation, but it has also put his life at danger, as well as the lives of his colleagues, friends, and family. Trump's tweets made Igor a target for the alt-right. He has since received many death threats. I've never been a Russian agent. It is ridiculous to suggest that. It's a stigma. Being a Russian spy is quite different from being James Bond. There are myths. I'm afraid for my life. I want to stay healthy. I want to stay alive. After Mr. Dechenko's lawyer, Mark Schammel, sent letters to Mr. Graham and the Republicans, demanding that they stop calling his client a Russian agent, Mr. Graham denied that he had made false statements. 
He added that as a public official, he is legally immune to defamation lawsuits. About two weeks after Dachenko's public unmasking, his lawyer was asked, "Is Igor Dachenko worried?" His lawyer responded, "Yes, he fears for his life." The Russian government has engaged in espionage against Americans. Igor was the first to connect the dots about the Trump-Russia coordination effort in 2016. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000. Emails that are missing. Igor met with the FBI and provided truthful, honest, and complete answers to all their questions. We also know that in a follow-up interview with Danchenko in March of 2017, he admitted he told the FBI that his subsources' information was quote not worth a grain of salt end quote, and yet the FBI continued to press forward. He accepted a paid assignment. He was asked to investigate the potential leader of the free world. He relayed what he learned to Christopher Steele and the research firm. He completed his assignment. But now, now his life is at risk. Thank、you